Here's my cochlea. That is the final thing where my inner ear lives, or my internal ear. Okay. All right. So if you're hearing my voice, let's go through it. You're going to vibrate something. What would vibrate when you hear my voice? The eardrum first. And that's going to vibrate what? The ossicles. And that's going to vibrate what? The cochlea. The cochlea. So we're vibrating all these things. But we're not done yet. Because then we're going to break into the cochlea. Let's zoom inside a cochlea and see what's inside the snail. Give me a second here. Let me show you a snail. This is, they took the snail and unrolled it. So don't do that, kill something. They took the snail and unrolled it, you'd see this. What is this blue crud? Perilous. Yeah, I got that. Perilous, right there. What does that mean in English? What's the fluid. fluid. So inside your cochlea is full of fluid. So there's fluid inside the snail. So you're vibrating the eardrum, which vibrates the bones, which shakes the snail, which does what to the fluid? <laughs> vibrates the fluid or shakes the fluid. As you see in this picture, you're vibrating or moving or pick a word you prefer, the fluid in the snail. So you wiggle the snail to wiggle the fluid. We're not done yet. Because I'm going to show you now this picture. This is looking in the snail one more time. It took the fluid out. The fluid will be in the white spaces. We're going to zoom in right here. Wow. Ooh. Ah. What do you see here? Hair cells. So inside your snail, in the fluid, are hair cells. The fancy word are stereocilia. You can say hair cells, I'm cool with that. The salad didn't hit you with a stereocilia. What do hairs do in fluid? They move. Think of seaweed in the surf, right? We're forcing the fluid to bend the hairs. Look where the hairs are attached. What is this right here? It's a nerve. What nerve do you suppose that might be? Vestibulocochlea. Vestibulocochlea nerve. And what's that responsible for? Balance and hearing. In this case, it's the hearing. So as you're hearing my voice, you're wiggling fluid to wiggle the hairs, to wiggle the nerve, to wiggle your brain. Basically. Right? And I just made you made you I just made you laugh because you hurt me. Right? So that goes to the cochlear nerve. It's a very simple system in the sense that all I'm doing is vibrating all these structures in a row, causing the fluid to bend the hairs, to bend the nerve, to send a signal. What part of your brain would actually hear me? Temporal lobe, right? It's where you actually interpret the sound. So again, my ears are just relaying a message, and my brain interprets what it is. If you know how a microphone or speaker works, they got the idea here. You bend up my brain, the membrane then creates a signal up to your brain. All right? So let me show you another couple pictures of this, and then I'll show you the animation, because I know you love those so. This is just showing you what happens as you go through these parts. So let's begin. Here's outer ear, external ear, the thing you pierce out here. Here's my middle ear, the bones. Here's my inner ear, which is the fluid in the snail. Hey, why is this graph looking different? So it amplifies. It amplifies. Where did it amplify? At the hand. Yeah, that's why you have those bones. We're those trivia, that's an amplifier. So as you're hearing my voice, the bones are like levers, and they make it bigger vibration. So my eardrum vibrates, makes the bones amp it up to push more on the fluid in the snail. Right? But again, it's all vibration is what my ear is picking up. Make sense? So it vibrates and vibrates and vibrates and vibrates. Let me show you one more view of this. This is a picture here. So here's my snail shell, here's my cochlea, my inner <coughs> ear. This tube represents the fluid. It's in my ear, makes a little turn like that. And then what they don't show you is there'll be little hairs lining it. So as the fluid bends, the hairs get bent and make a sound. Make sense? All right, now what's going to freak you out a little bit is this picture here. 
Here again is my snail. Here again is what the hairs can hear. Your ear is set up like a piano, basically. Hairs on different parts of the snail only bend at certain frequencies. And they look like this. All right, so bass is over here, treble is up here. So let's say you happen to go to a lot of rock concerts with a screaming guitar. That guitar is at 1500 hertz. It isn't, I don't know what it is. Let's pretend it's here. And that hair keeps getting bent over and over and over. What do hairs do if you keep bending them? They break. Stop. They break. So what will happen to your hearing if that hair is missing? It will start to lose it. You won't hear that frequency, right? That hair won't be there. The brain won't know that frequency exists. You just lost your hearing. You're <laughs> As these hairs break off and die as you get older, you'll lose the frequencies on the piano where they would get bent. So you start losing frequencies in hearing. Baby boomer deafness. Right? Screaming guitar, right about here. So the concept is your brain's interpreting what hairs are getting bent and making sounds in your brain that correspond. So when you hear a symphony, the brain's picking up all these hairs getting bent and creating the tune in your head. By magic. Good answer. But again, it's vibrating the hairs along the snail that does it. Make sense? Have a cool system, I think. But let me show you one more thing. Look right here. What the heck is that, and why does it look like that? Here's where the sound's going in. Here's my bone pushing the fluid. What's that? That stops it. On window. Why? <laughs> What's that doing? Let's find out. So we're going to watch an animation now. Uh, one of these, is, give me just a second to put on the screen. And we'll see what happens. All right, so this is ignoring the outer ear stuff. This is just focusing on the middle ear, which is eardrum, bones. Here's my snail, which they kind of unroll. The blue is the fluid. The hairs would be in this pinky zone. All right. Why is there sound? There used to be sound. <laughs> awesome. Ah, let's turn it on there. Let's try that. Let's try it again. I'm technically illiterate. Sound waves strike the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate. So remember, the answer on the test was going to be vibration. Your ears vibrating when you hear my beautiful voice. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the three bones of the middle ear to vibrate. The foot plate of the stapes vibrates in the oval window. Yeah, that oval window is just where you're pushing on the snail. So you push on the snails in the oval window. I didn't make this up, really. I didn't, right? But the stirrup pushes on its foot on the oval window of the snail. But you're pushing, and that vibration is getting amplified, pushing on the blue fluid in the snail. Since the snail is sealed, the fluid can't really go anywhere, so it has to vibrate. Let's keep going. Vibration of the foot plate causes the paralymph in the scala vestibuli to vibrate, which in turn causes displacement of the basal or membrane. So in English, the blue fluid pushes on the pink hairs. Short wavelengths from high-pitched sounds cause displacement of the basal or membrane near the oval window. This movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. Of course not. <laughs> wavelengths from low pitch sounds cause displacement of the basal or membrane far from the oval window. Again, this movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. What's the point of this? Actually? When the vibrations reach the paralymph in the scala tympani, they travel to the round window where they are dampened. All right. Now we got to figure out again that little green thing. I figured out this is where the sound comes in. Why do you need the round window according to this? Dampen it. Dampen it. Because if you think about it, everyone, when you were little in the bathtub and you pushed the water against one side, you did that because you knew the water would do what? Come back. It would hit the tub and bounce back, right? What would you hear if the wave went in, hit the wall, and bounced back through the snail? You hear like an inverted echo every time. The only way this can work is the sound gets one time through the snail, so it bends the hair once, and then I remove it. The way you remove it is you have a shock absorber right there. So they, the way this has to work is sound goes in here, and sound has to, quote, exit there. 
for one pass. Otherwise, you hear a constant ringing echo kind of thing. Echo, 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 echo. So it just catches the wave. Yeah, it's actually like a piece of membrane. And so when the wave hits, it bows out, absorbs the shock, and reflexes back. So is that the cochlea? That's, yep. they're calling it the scaly. Yeah, that's one of the tubes in the snail. So this is the out tube, is the skeleton. So you need two doors. You need a door in, that's the oval window. You need a door out, that's the round window. So let's put that on our magic wall of glory here. So in my snail, right, I'm going to go in the oval window. And that's going to push on the fluid. I'm going to come out the round window. I don't love these Romans. Windows, down, that's out. So when I'm pushing on the cochlea, I'm going in one door and out the other with the vibrations. The fluid only gets bent one time to bend the hairs, to bend the nerves. Right. <coughs> Make sense? It's a one-way sort of filtering system. That's why you see two doors there. I have to absorb the sound after one pass. Make sense? Yes. So when people say that they rupture their eardrum, yes. does that does that grow back by itself? Depends on how big the rupture is. Small ruptures, yes. Big ruptures, no. Okay. So the doctor can put tubes through your eardrum, get infections like I did as a kid. They can put tubes through it, and eventually they'll seal over. But if it tears or rips, it's like skin. It can't always regrow. But it can scar over, which makes it worse. Scar doesn't vibrate. Mm -hmm. So you end up losing your hearing. So you can damage your hearing out here by busting your eardrum. You damage your hearing in here, which is by breaking the hairs. Either way, you won't hear. Because you have to get the vibration all the way in there. Make sense? Keep going then. This is more than that, right? This is more than that. You can hear your eardrum? So vibrating, vibrating, vibrating. Questions on ears? For that part. Yeah. Um, I was at the Blues Fest this week, and I was working all, all the days. Uh, I still can't hear. Okay. Uh, why? There are two answers. It depends on if you ever get the hearing back or not. If you get it back, then what you're, there's two things that happen. If you have a really loud sound like a gunshot, you may remember that your ears sort of ring funny later. Okay. There's, it's one of your homework questions, I think, isn't it? <coughs> Let me check before I give you the answer. I'm going to tell you because that's for your homework. Uh, yeah, it's actually for next class, number seven. There's a muscle that clamps down on the eardrum and keeps it from moving to avoid that situation. So if a gunshot goes off, the ear eardrum is locked so it won't blow out the hair cells because it vibrates so fast. This is the pedius. That's that numbing sound when you can't hear after the concert. If you never get your hearing back, that means you broke the hairs off. Which is, have a nice time. <laughs> so there's a combination of out here loss of hearing and in here loss of hearing. Make sense? What is that muscle? That the pedius. The pedius is called anchor that. There's the tensor tympani and this the pedius, which anchor these amplifiers down. The safety valve. How does the hearing aid work? Does that just replace well, the, the... Remember when Grandpa had like the ear trumpet? Am I the only one that had Okay. <laughs> so the ear trumpet was just the blow in their ladder. So the thing he wore on his chest basically had a speaker next to the ear drum. So you could amplify and beat on the drum harder. Then they upgraded to cochlear implants. Can anyone guess where cochlear implants would be? In here. Okay. In here. So we bypass all this plumbing and we just go right to the fluid, right? So what we're doing is we're vibrating the fluid through the receiver, and the fluid then amplifies the signal. Or you can also have cochlear implants that go directly on the nerve and amplify the nerve and skip the fluid. But you're trying to go past all the plumbing in the front to get to the wiring that goes to the brain. So it depends on which kind of ear thing you have. There's also, because I'm deaf in my right ear, and there's also like the cochlear implants that vibrate your butt loops. Right. Right. So you get all sorts of yeah. You can get some that vibrate in here, in here. Depends on kind of yeah. what they want to do. So it's conductive or neurological, as opposed to the ear kind of thing. Make sense? So anything that gets the fluid to move should work. So you're going to get out your packet of doom for a second, or 
for a while. here and figure out number one. We're supposed to figure out Michael who's a child. He has an inner ear, I'm sorry, a middle ear infection of Titus Mania. Where would he have an infection with a middle ear infection? Let's go over here. Where's middle ear on my diagram? Bones and things, right? So when you have a middle ear infection, you've infected the middle ear, which is the bones from the cavity they're in. Makes sense, right? Or Titus Mania is here. So let's look at a picture one more time. See if we can figure out where that is. So on this picture, middle ear would be basically between your eardrum, where my hand is wiping, and the snail. That is your middle ear cavity. Make sense? Okay. How do you get an infection in the middle of your ear? Up your station to Very good. So if you look down here, we have some questions, but we first have to figure out this tube right here. This calls it the auditory tube. You, the old name was your station tube. It's perfectly legit. Why do you have a tube here? To drain. To drain. Why would I need to drain my middle ear? Excess fluid. Excess fluid. What's wrong with extra fluid in my middle ear? Pressure. Pressure on what? The tympanic. Wouldn't it push on my eardrum? Yeah. So what happened if I have pressure on my eardrum? What would happen? Could it vibrate? Yeah. Right. So the trick is, for this to work, my eardrum has to be able to vibrate. And anything that could keep it from vibrating would stop you from hearing, right? So if you had fluid behind the eardrum, it wouldn't vibrate. What happens if you go up in an airplane and they pressurize the cabin? What would the eardrum do if there's too much pressure on it? It would pop. It wouldn't vibrate. So your mom told you on the airplane, what are you supposed to do? Chew gum. Chew gum. So if you think about it, you learned this in 231. This tube ends up basically right about here, by your jaw. Every time you move your jaw, you open this tube. That equalizes the pressure on both sides of the eardrum, so it doesn't get too much pressure over the other. Because if you don't do that, the eardrum could bow in or bow out or become pressurized, which doesn't work. Make sense? Ever forget to chew the gum on the plane and you find out you can't hear anything? Mm -hmm. Your eardrum can't vibrate anymore very well. So it doesn't push the bones, push the fluid, push the snail. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So depending on the position of a baby, yes. sometimes babies can get ear infections yes. from the position that their mm -hmm. mom... So how does that work? Well, let's get there. There's a question. Hold that thought. Oh, okay. We'll get there. I have an answer for you. So do it again, this is station two. This is a pressure relief system because I have to vibrate my eardrum. Maybe you get swimmers here? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. You don't, have, you don't have, that was a rhetorical device, you don't have to actually admit to it. But you end up with water, and what happens if you're hearing you get swimmers here? Can't hear. Can't hear, right? There's water, it's pressing on the eardrum, it doesn't vibrate, and things move in into an eardrum. Right? So again, for this to work, I have to have a free eardrum, which is what that station two is for. So let's go through the case study and see how that relates to Michael and his infection. All right, so here we go. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Why would a doctor ask about coughs and colds? Where are coughs and colds located in your body normally? Your sinuses. Uh, yeah, airway, right? Right by my jaw, which is right by that tube. So, gee, you have bacteria crawling up your throat, and where do they decide to visit? They just decide to go up to your ear because there's a connection between your ear and your throat right here. So ear infections are not something crawling in from the outside. They're crawling up from your throat is how ear infections get in there. If you're a kid or a parent, you know this. Kids get a cold, and then the next week they have an ear infection. <laughs> that's, the, that's the connection between the two. I had it for like five years. 
Make sense? So again, it's something going up that pressure relief tubing. It's getting in there. Make sense? So give me a symptom of an ear infection. What do you notice when you have them? Pain. 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 Fever. You're hearing. Fever. Dizziness. Dizziness. The kids pull it in their ear. They all say they can't hear you, right? The same, these things, because I can't vibrate my ear, I can't hear you. So again, stuff's coming up the throat. Make sense? All right. Hey, we got the bottle breast thing. Okay, this has nothing to do with what's in the milk. It has to do with how you do it. The position. So, where do you put babies when you bottle feed them? On their backs, right? So let's imagine that. I have a bottle here. <laughs> so if I'm on my back, okay, uh, okay, notice the angle of my throat. My ears are below my mouth. So what happens if the ears are below your mouth? They go into And you have a tube like that. <clears throat> Just rotate it. Oh my god. It's not anatomically correct. <laughs> <laughs> what would gravity just do with everything that's in your food It'd in your throat? It'd go into the tube. It's going to drain backwards, back in the back of my throat, down the tube, into my ear. Because gravity wins, right? If you breastfeed, you tend to do what with them? You tend to hold them more vertical. I mean, this is a broad brush kind of statement, right? They tend to be more vertical. Oh, that. Wrong button. Please go back. It tends to hold it more where gravity is pulling the bacteria down the throat, away from the ear. It tends to, you know, not every time, blah, blah, blah. Right? There's also a difference in how the milk comes out. How do you get milk out of a bottle? Suction. Suction. So, when you suck, ever hock up a loogie? Am I the one that missed that? <laughs> right? So maybe sucking hard in a bottle, they're going to pull mucus up their throat toward their ear. How does milk get out of the breast? Right, the, the, milk, the breast actually ejects the milk, so there's less pressure difference, less suction. The main point is this tubing. The tubing is higher than the ear, stuff falls back to the ear. Yes? Aren't children more prone to because they're used to patients who whistle little... Hold that thought! That is right down number five. Hold that thought. Okay, you're okay on the tubing. So again, position of the head. So what about the smoking thing? The husband, he doesn't have an ear infection. Oh, smoke rises. Smoke rises, but why would the baby have an ear infection if dad smokes like a loser? Like a loser. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> what does smoking do to anyone who works in a bar or a waitress? What does smoking do to your... your makes you more sensitive. Gives you more sensitive, and what do you find building up over time? Blood. Blood. Mucus. And where's that mucus hanging out? In your throat, right? So a baby who's exposed to smoke would have more mucus building up in their throat. It's irritating. And what can live in mucus? Bacteria. And what can bacteria do if they're in your throat mucus? They can slide up through your ear. Yeah. Also affects your immune system and blah, blah, blah. But the trick is, anything that causes me to get more slime and snot near this tube, like hanging around smokers, would cause more bacteria to climb in. That's where they come from. Make sense? Now let's answer the question at the bottom. You don't get ear infections, but your kids do because? Shorter. That's right. If you look at a baby's face, their faces are round. This tube is shorter than a baby. It also tends to be more flat. So if you have a shorter tube, it's a shorter distance. When you become older, your face elongates, the tube gets longer, vertical gravity, all that stuff. So you're, you go from a cute baby to an ugly adult, oh you my gain God. tubing. Yes. What is the anatomy of an earache? Depends on where it aches. Or, is it, I mean, or the physiology. Is it generally inflammation? Generally. So in general, like an inner earache or a middle earache, fluid's building up in here or someone's chewing on it. It starts to bow this out. Because this is bone. You can't really do much with it. But you can push in the sinuses so they get pressure, this begins to bow out, and these nerves begin to fire, saying there's a lot of pressure. Here's a sinus infection, just pushing more on stuff that the brain doesn't, that, that uses, loses. the brain doesn't usually get signals from your sinuses, and so when it gets them, it thinks your whole side of your head's falling off, because normally what would happen, so you get this huge pain. So you pull on the outside ear, because it's the only thing your brain's used to talk to. Make sense? So take home message. I have to keep the vibration, therefore I need two tubes into my ear. One from the pressure side, one from the external side, for this to keep vibrating. I'm going to vibrate my ear. Make sense?
Mm-hmm. But we're not done yet, because we just did the hearing part. There's another part, which you said was the balance part. Let's look at that. Let me show you this picture here one more time. So here again was our snail, the cochlea, back here. And now we're going to focus on this other part of the snail. Self-motion, head position, and spatial orientation relative to gravity. Okay, anyone know why they call it vestibular? That's a synonym for bounce, but why do you think vestibular? Yeah, that's called the vestibule. So a quick hand of saying balance, say vestibular. So you can say balance, I'm cool with that. You can say vestibular. They're both implying the non-hearing part. So if you're not hearing, you are vestibulating. Don't ask me. That's just how it goes. The function of the vestibular system can be simplified by remembering some basic terminology of classical mechanics. <laughs> sure, we all know that. All bodies moving in three dimensions have six degrees of freedom. Three of these are translational, and three are rotational. The translational components may be given in terms of movements along the S, Y, and Z axes of the head. This graph of vector changes. Rotations about the X, Y, and Z axes are commonly referred to as roll. <laughs> and yaw. No, this is not on your test. The <laughs> positive direction of head rotation follows a right hand rule. That is, if the fingers of the right hand are curled in the direction of the arrows, the thumb points in the positive direction of the axis. Okay, I really don't care. <laughs> Very deep in the temporal bone. The main peripheral component of the vestibular system is an elaborate set of interconnected chambers, the labyrinth, that has much in common and is in fact continuous with the cochlea. Okay, so here's where you get some language differences. The cochlea is the snail. What happens in your snail? Hearing. Hearing. So hearing is always cochlear. That's understood. The balance part you can call the vestibular system. You can also call it the labyrinth because it's maze-like. But usually, when, depending on who you talk to, they may use different phrasing. But usually, cochlea always means just the hearing. The other words mean the rest of the plumbing. So you'll hence vestibulocochlear nerve. Right? Cochlear means the hearing part of the nerve. Vestibulo means the non-hearing part of the nerve. Right? It's just the way they do it. So just don't let those words, you'll hear them interchange. Just labyrinth, stupid you know, they're all part of that. So the labyrinth consists of the two otolith organs, we'll the utricle and bit. saccule, and three semicircular canals. The vestibular hair cells, which, like cochlear hair cells, transduce minute displacements into behaviorally relevant receptor potentials. Good gravy, what's the best? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see it. Hair cells, transduce, meaning... They send a signal. Displacement, vibration, receptor potentials, nerves. So I bend the hairs to get the nerves going. That's what all that means in doctor speak, right? So, so again, I'm lots of ways to say. and saccule, and in three jug like swellings called ampullae, located at the base of the semicircular canals next to the utricle. In the utricle and saccule, the sensory epithelium, or macula, consists of hair cells and associated supporting cells. Okay, so let's add this to the board before they walk through it, because that's a slightly different structure than these ones. So your semicircular canals are the big tubes. You also have these things. So if you're going to write down utricle, so let me this word up once, and yeah. saccule. They're the same part, but they are not canals full of fluid. According to this picture, what do they have in them? What do you see? Hair. There's hair cells, but what do you see on top of the hair cells? Oh, uh, crystals. Crystals. Rocks. The rocks you'll laugh at are called autoliths. Medical terminology people. Lith. Rock. Auto. Ear, ear rocks. Perfectly legitimate test. Ear rocks. But there are rocks in your head. Your mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> but they contain rocks. Rocks that are sitting on top of the hairs. Which way do rocks go? Down. Down. So every time I move my head, 
the rocks will bend the hair cells. So I have one more way of detecting where I am by bending rocks and bending the hair. So to show you I'm not making this up much, let me go back to a static picture of this, which is right here. So here are my autolyphs, my ear rocks. Here are my hair cells. As they fall down from gravity, they bend the hairs. And that also tells my brain where down is. Right? The rock should always be down no. on the head. So when you tip your head down like that, the way you feel that is the rocks in your head just move. That's a different motion than moving the fluid. Right? So we have a word for both of these. The semicircular canals, the one with fluid. The fluid moves when I move, so we call this your dynamic equilibrium. What does dynamic mean? In motion. So if you're saying no and yes, and dancing a jig, you're using your semicircular canals. I'm moving fluid in my head. But the rocks are basically up and down, which we call static equilibrium. So literally, dynamic is motion, static is gravity. And those two combined tell you where you are. I'll give you an example. Go in the elevator here, push the button. When the elevator goes up, what do you feel? Feels like you're pulling down. Gravity changed, right? Gravity didn't change. What changed in the elevator? The rocks did. The rocks are pushing more on the hairs. Your brain thinks gravity has changed. Right? That's different than you spinning your head and feeling where your head is dynamically. So if you were to dance in an elevator, you would do both. <laughs> You'd have to change your gravity and your dyna dynamism. Dynamism. Dynamic. So both those systems are combining for a balanced interpretation. So what happens with the rocks in an elevator? I'm sorry, I missed that. They go down more. They go down more, okay. you feel more up. Make sense? So anytime the rocks move, your body thinks gravity is changing. So are people ever born without the rocks? But as you know? I think I read somewhere they are, but I can't quote you how many are to know. You just vomit all the time. Oh. So you said two systems, would you just call them the dynamic and static yes. system? Yes. Okay. So you'll hear that dynamic and static equilibrium will say vestibular organs, and they call this one sort of the labyrinth thing. You'll just hear different uh, words, or you just combine those balanced organs. So, yeah. um, people who get dizzy really easily, uh -huh. or like car sick, really, uh -huh. um, do they have more like hair cells, or do they just have a problem with their the way that their uh, canals are shaped? Usually neither, so their brain just gets sensitive. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Remember when you were a kid, you can go on every every roller coaster and it wasn't fast enough? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you turn 30 and then you vomit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was not that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Your brain somehow reinterprets the information as being, this is making me nauseous, as opposed to this is fun. Right? So for a lot of people, as you get older, your body's... Your interpretation of balance changes, not the actual balance itself, although that can change. So that's why people get more afraid of height as right. they get older? As you get wiser, your brain realizes something, like you shouldn't be doing that. But <laughs> that's the brain's interpretation. We'll talk more about motion sickness in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, how does alcohol affect balance? Good question. Alcohol turns off your cerebellum. So if I don't have a cerebellum, I don't know about my balance. So when you do your sobriety, I have a friend who <clears throat> failed the sobriety test. Actually, I've never been drunk. But <laughs> well, why does that work? Why can't you walk on the curb? Because you have no idea where your body is to walk on the curb unless you watch yourself. That's why they have you close your eyes and keep your head back, because you can't find your nose because you can't feel any of these. So it's your brain who's being affected, not your That's ears. That's right. Your ears are fine. Your brain doesn't know it. brain's not on. These are simply sending the message and no one's on the computer. Drugs do stupid stuff. They do. Where was I at? What was I doing with Maria? Okay, let's go back to this. Okay, here we go. Overlying the hair cells and their stereocilia is a gelatinous layer. Above this layer is a fibrous structure, the otolithic membrane, in which are embedded crystals of calcium carbonate called otoconia. The crystals give the otolith organs their name. Otolith is Greek for ear stone.
The otoconium make the otolithic membrane considerably heavier than the structures and fluids surrounding it. Thus, when the head tilts, gravity causes the membrane to shift relative to the sensory epithelium. The resulting shearing motion between the otolithic membrane and the macula displaces the hair bundles, which are embedded in the lower gelatinous surface of the membrane. This displacement of the hair bundles generates a receptor potential in the hair cells that is dependent upon the direction of tilt. So in English, right, I'm bending the hairs, I change the neuron, and the trick is we kind of read through the lines here. Mm -hmm. I'm changing the frequency of those hair cells, just like we did with the eyeball. Like the brain doesn't know where your head is, the brain just knows that change in a particular way, and interprets that as down, up, whatever. Right? So, so anything that changes those rocks changes the bend, changes the frequency, my brain has to then reassess what I'm doing. I have a question. Yeah. What is the um, gelatinous surface of the membrane? What is that? Is it's, it just really thick? Yeah, it's basically mucus. It's just a thick That's mucus. inside the ear? The mucin type. So it's, it's thicker than mucus, but not as thick as, say, wax. It's kind of a... Ear slime. Ear slime. <laughs> awesome. <Works for> me. <laughs> Movement of the stereocilia toward the kinocilium causes potassium channels to open, depolarizing the hair cell. The depolarization results in neurotransmitter release and excitation of the vestibular nerve fibers. Movement of the stereocilia in the direction away from the kinocilium closes the channels, hyperpolarizing the hair cell and thus reducing vestibular nerve activity. Right, so the trick is your brain just gets different number of signals and has to interpret that. And it's the vestibular nerve because it's the balanced nerve, half, not the very half. Make sense? A shearing motion between the macula and the autolithic membrane also occurs when the head undergoes linear accelerations. Hair bundle displacement occurs transiently in response to linear accelerations and tonically in response to tilting of the head. So in English, when you punch the car to speed up, you feel like gravity now is different because the rocks move in relation to that. So you're moving the rocks, the brain thinks gravity just changed. That's the same idea, I'm simply telling the brain we're up and down are. Now let's make it more difficult. Whereas the otolith organs are primarily concerned with head translations and orientation with respect to gravity, the semicircular canals sense head rotations arising either from self-induced movements or from angular accelerations of the head imparted by external forces. Each of the three semicircular canals has at its base a bulbous expansion called the ampulla, which houses the sensory epithelium, or crista, that contains the hair cells. The structure of the canal suggests how they detect the angular accelerations that arise through rotation of the head. The hair bundles extend out of the crista into a gelatinous mass, the cupula, that bridges the width of the ampulla, forming a viscous barrier through which endolymph cannot circulate. As a result, the relatively compliant cupula is distorted by movements of the endolymphatic fluid. Is it English? What did she just try to tell you? Liquid moves. Uh, fluid right. fluid between the papillas and it moves. That's right. So the fluid usually can't get through here. So if I push in the fluid, I bend the hairs. And that causes a signal, right? So, same concept. I'm vibrating hairs and bending them. All this kind of goof. Right? When the head turns in the plane of one of the semicircular canals, the inertia of the endolymph produces a force across the cupula, distending it away from the direction of head movement and causing a displacement of the hair bundles within the crista. In contrast, linear accelerations of the head produce equal forces on the two sides of the cupula so the hair bundles are not displaced. Each semicircular canal works in concert with the partner located on the other side of the head that has its hair cells aligned oppositely. There are three such pairs. One pair of horizontal canals and the superior canal on each side working with the posterior canal on the other side. Both are in the same plane. The orientation of the horizontal canals makes them selectively sensitive to rotation in the horizontal plane. More specifically, the hair cells in the canal toward which the head is turning are depolarized, while those on the other side are hyperpolarized. That's kind of cool if you think about it. 
So every time I turn my head, one tube goes one way, but the other tube goes the opposite way. So my brain can interpret which direction you just spun. Right? I'm the difference between the two frequencies. Right? So up and down, left and right, your brain can interpret that by comparing the two ears to each other and determining what that means. Cool, huh? Your brain's pretty smart. For example, when the head turns to the left, the cupula is pushed toward the kinocilium in the left horizontal canal, and the firing rate of the relevant axons in the left vestibular nerve increases. In contrast, the cupula in the right horizontal canal is pushed away from the kinocilium, with a concomitant decrease in the firing rate of the related neurons. If the head turns to the right, the result is just the opposite. Getting two carpenter levels attached. This push pull arrangement operates for all three pairs of canals. The pair whose activity is modulated is in the plane of the rotation, and the member of the pair whose activity is increased is on the side toward which the head is turning. The net result is a system that provides information about the rotation of the head in any direction. Sense. So again, you're moving fluid to bend hairs. You move rocks, you move fluid. But you're going to vibrate a hair somewhere. So on your exam, make sure you write hair cell somewhere. That's kind of the answer. Your hands, <coughs> some of canals, pilots. Cool, huh? All righty then. So let's go back to your packet of doom here. Find the page, case on the next page. Case number two. So the first case is about a hearing problem. This one is going to be about a balance problem. So we're still dealing with the same part. What organ does balance? Ears. Ear. Ear. So again, it's an ear problem, but a different part of the ear. We're dealing with semicircular canals and these things for balance versus cochlea. So what you're going to do with your team, you're going to read through Anna's symptoms. And then read about the two disorders in the second paragraph. And then you're going to diagnose her, a number two, which one does she have? And we're going to give you about a oh, minute or so to sort of read through those symptoms, try to diagnose that she have BPB or Meniere's. So we'll figure it out. We'll walk through the logic.